Hi, welcome back to the Always Right Podcast. I'm author Carissa DeLay. And I'm author Jamie Vendera, and we have a very special guest today. Very special. Yes, best-selling author. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm so happy to be with both of you today. I'm Allison Richman, a historical novelist um, with a new book coming out soon. Yes, we're going to talk about that. But let me tell you something, and I'm going to be completely honest. I typically do not read historical fiction, but I bought... Here it is in the screen. I bought The Lost Wife because of your titles. That was the one that really spoke to me, just the premise of it. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I really enjoyed your writing. Your writing just overall brought me in. Even though that's not my typical type of book, it didn't bore me. I wasn't like, ugh, it's a history class. No, this was really amazing. You did a great job. I want to be brutally honest, too. Like, we were on for about half an hour before, and I'm like... Yeah, I'm going to have to break down. And, get into, and I know my wife. She, You're, I was going to say, that. Diane, his yeah. wife, would totally love this. All yeah. right, but let's get into you. Let's get into mm-hmm. this one because, like I said, I read, like, this book was, like, what, three books or four books ago? Um, yeah, about – it came yeah, out but, in 2011, and it was my uh, – it was, it was about five books ago. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you've written, what, I just seven? finished my 10th. Wow. Um, tenth, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Look at you. All right. Uh, would you like to kind of give us a little insight to um, who you are as this historical fiction fiction writer? Absolutely. So I have been writing historical fiction for the past 20 something years. Mm-hmm. I originally actually wanted to be a painter. So mm-hmm. when you were mentioning that you thought that the the way that I wrote sort of drew you into, into the story of The Lost Wife... Um, it made my heart full because I think the way I approach writing is from an artistic lens, you know, to Mm -hmm. be able to recreate on the page something very visual, very textured, very centrally written that you all all of your senses are evoked while you're reading my, my prose. So a book like The Lost Wife, which is about a artist who survives the Holocaust uh, during World War II, primarily because of her artistic skill that the Mm -hmm. the Nazis actually are able to exploit for their own, you know, gain using it for propaganda artwork and artwork done within the camp. But it also shows the artistic resistance and the ability for an artist's spirit not to be extinguished in, you know, the most, you know, brutal and horrific times. So that character was really such a joy to, even though it was such a brutal subject matter, it was a joy for me to write because truly it was like seeing history unfolding through someone's eyes who's incredibly observant and who sees the world through light and shadow, who sees the world like with very distinct color and texture. And so I think that lens is very evocative for a reader to be able to see and walk in the footsteps of a character. Yeah. And you're talking about Lenka. Mm-hmm. But the irony of that is she is she sees the the beauty and the detail and, and mm-hmm. this imagery. So Jamie, I know you haven't read this book, but so yeah, she was married to her soulmate essentially. Mm-hmm. That was this kind of pre yeah preoccupation in yeah. Czechoslovakia. Yeah, and the thing is, they he she gets he gets to flee to America, and she gets to, she's stuck, and he thinks that she's taken to the concentration camp and doesn't make it. Mm-hmm. But when they meet again. Mm-hmm ironically their grandchildren's wedding, wedding. Mm-hmm. he recognize he he recognizes her mm-hmm. soul essentially mm-hmm. and she just kind of is distant because i feel like even though they both were married there was this like this clinging to the past mm-hmm. even like and i didn't even think of that i really didn't even think of that like how many people well, had to remarry not because of love because they lost their love during exactly. that like, and they had I, to forge ahead Yes. Yeah, you feel that. And I think you're you're touching upon something very essential um, about The Lost Wife, which is how do we experience memory, especially mm-hmm. as we age? Mm-hmm. You know, as you mentioned, Joseph, her first husband, Linka's first husband, he's literally clinging to the past because he has never forgotten the mm-hmm. woman that he loved, who he married. And he's also incredi- feels incredibly guilty that he he left her in Czechoslovakia, you know, believing that he was going to be able to get her to safety to America once he got there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of guilt, but his, the book is written a lot with his, the way he sees the past and how he 
he clings to those memories of their early romance and, you know, their love and all those things where she, having gone through the Holocaust, really in order to forge ahead in her, you know, her new life when she eventually does come to America, really suppresses a lot of the past when she gets here. And so it's, you know, how do we experience memory when there's trauma associated with it? Mm -hmm. It's different for every person. Um, and so I use that fact of, of, of how we, we each experience memory differently to write their two voices in first person of how they experience the war and their separation and then, the, of course, their eventual reunion. Yeah, and you did a great job. Which kind of brings me to one of the questions I had listed to ask you was, do you feel like there's this responsibility you have for your readers with historical novels and making sure certain things are accurate. very accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very accurate to that time period, as well as not, I feel like sometimes with historical stuff, you got to be pretty on point or people are going to call you out on it. Absolutely. I think actually that's one of the most important like vows you have to make as a historical novelist is to really be true to the facts. Um, and if you, for some reason, have to massage something in your author's note, you acknowledge that you took some liberties in a particular you know, part of your manuscript. I, mean, I don't actually write a single sentence of one of my books until I feel that I've exhausted as much research as I possibly can. I like to describe my research process as almost, you know, it's sewn onto my skin by the time I sit down to write that I'm not stopping and starting you to, try to feel understand like you, you're something. living it yourself. Yes. Yes. It inhabits yes. me. Everything I've researched, you know, we can talk about my methodology, whether it's, you know, I try and visit the country as much as possible, whether it's one, at least one trip there. If I'm writing about a time period where people still are alive who've lived through that time mm -hmm. in history, I really aggressively try and and pursue contact so that I can hear people's oral histories and ask them direct questions because you know they lived through it so they mm -hmm. are really people who I, I uh, it's 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 that's one of the best things you can do is if you can find someone who lived through that time period so I was lucky enough with the lost wife to go to uh you know the Czech Republic go to the concentration camp of Terezin walk in you know alongside a survivor who was there have her introduced me to people who she knew were artists who were at that particular camp then get their oral history so it's a layering of as many people who are willing to share your story, they become imprinted in your soul when you're writing the book. And there's, an, there's a like trust that they, mm -hmm. they believe that you're going to do right by them and their story. And so I take that incredibly seriously. I will never take liberties with, with, with fact with my right. book. And if for some reason there's something with a date where I had to have someone leave a week before something, you know, I will acknowledge that in my author's note. So you, do you pay a lot of attention to detail, like the clothing, the slang they may have used at those times? Yes. So I absolutely um, take into, consider into consideration everything that you mentioned. I, you know, my father was an electrical engineer, and he used to say to truly understand something, you need to be able to take apart all the intricate pieces and learn how to put it back together again. And I think that's really what writing historical fiction is like there are so many pieces that go into creating a narrative that is historically accurate it's not just the timeline of what happened per se in a particular war when you know germans came into a particular country and occupied it as you mentioned what were people wearing what were on the newspaper headlines if you were walking mm -hmm. down the street if a mother was preparing dinner that you know evening and rations were already in place and her you know how long did it did it take to wait online with your ration card and how much meat were you able to have to feed a family of five. What, you know, in The Lost Wife, I learned that um, Jewish people had their pets taken away, confiscated at a certain time, their radios taken away, those little things that, you know, when you're creating a household in an environment, when the things like your pet, I mean, can imagine if someone came in and said, you can no longer have your dog. How does that affect not only, you know, your character, but, you know, smaller children in the house and all those things go into creating a scene. And that takes months and months of research to feel that you actually understand that in the timeline and then the emotional effect on your characters. Yeah, that's, that's great. Do you, do you ever um, have like a, I feel like a, a spinny wheel that tells you what time period you'd like to, to focus on in your next book? How do you decide the time period? 
So it's not so much that I decide a time period, but I, I feel like I walk through this earth very open for people to tell me their stories and to mm -hmm. hear things that sometimes strike me that I personally feel I'm incredibly curious about learning more about. And so when that happens, I start to pay attention to it and think there might be a story there and then start to investigate and learn more about that particular time in history. Um, again, you know, trying to see if there's anyone alive during that time period to learn more and, and then building around that to see if there is a novel. So how do you go about finding, and this is a vague question, but, or a strange question. How do you go about finding if someone's alive during that? I mean, are, are you on boards, like post, mm -hmm. like Facebook boards? Are you going to certain communities? Well, how are you mm -hmm. discovering these people? So it's a great question. I think, you know, as, so, as someone who I kind of consider myself, you know, particularly introverted because I do like to be at home by myself writing my books, it does require a certain amount of getting yourself out there and being brave enough to tell everyone that you possibly know that you're trying to find people who might be alive during this, mm -hmm. you know, the time period that you're researching. So, for example, my new book that comes out in October, The Time October yeah, October 15th. Thank you so much. The Time Keeper Keepers delves into the aftermath of the Vietnam War against a small suburban town on Long Island when a Vietnam veteran and a Vietnamese refugee, their lives unexpectedly intertwine and sets them both on the path towards not only friendship, but also healing. Writing that book, it was essential that not only I meet as, as many Vietnam veterans as I could to be able to hear their story and their perspective, but also the very large Vietnamese community that came over here after, you know, the fall of, of, of Vietnam, um, those who, um, particularly in South Vietnam, who had allied themselves to the Americans during the war and whose lives were in great danger um, and experiencing great suffering in their native country after the communists took over. So they actually, you know, they were sometimes called the boat people who came over in the late 1970s and early 80s, you know, piling onto these small wooden crafts to try and get to America, not realizing the distance from Vietnam mm. to America. So they were often picked up by large, you know, vessels that then took them to um, refugee centers, sometimes in Malaysia or Hong Kong before they were able to, you know, get sponsorship in the United States. So I had to really sort of every person that I knew say, do you know anyone who experienced this? And eventually I did make contacts when make, you know, friendships with people who were willing to tell their story. Just on Saturday, um, Pete, this Vietnam veteran on Long Island who basically arrived at my doorstop, uh, doorstep at 11 a.m. for lunch because um, I wanted to make him lunch when he agreed to tell me his experience in Vietnam. He didn't actually leave till 2 a.m. You know, wow. He, wow. He sat down and he had never told his story to anyone. This is a man in his, you know, mid seventies who um had sort of suppressed his his memories. Had, you know, really they were so traumatic, he never shared them with his his family. And as he faced his own mortality, it was now or never to be able to have someone who was really interesting in taking his, you know, his oral history and putting it into a book. And that friendship between us sort of ensued so that now when he calls me, he always says, I'm just calling for a heart check, which I sort of love, oh, you know, to see how we're that's awesome. doing. You're and almost a therapist. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, people have said that, like, because you I deal with people's trauma, like listening mm -hmm. to their trauma and trying to find a way to share that with readers without it being told in a way that's so horrific that you don't want to read the story. I have to kind of create language that emotionally tethers you to their journey mm -hmm. and ultimately bring you to the other side, which is hopefully light. But there is a lot of listening to people who have suffered tremendously. I mean, I don't want to cry, but it's really yeah. hard. No, know? this yeah. is amazing. I mean, these I'm are... Assuming, I'm assuming you're an empath when it comes I to... Such you absorb that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking... This is like, I mean, of course, these are very intimate stories that they're sharing with mm -hmm. you, but I mean, I could literally see you having a podcast <laughs> sharing this. I got to ask mm -hmm. this book, The Timekeepers, is based in America, but you mm -hmm. had said earlier that you like to travel to, to the countries mm -hmm. to make sure, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. since this is in America, maybe you have flashbacks with this Vietnamese uh, I do, person. and I traveled to Vietnam, okay. if that's your, your that question. That was my question. I'm like, yeah. you know, did you need to travel? But I'm like, I did. I'm thinking, yes. I did absolutely need to travel to Vietnam for many reasons. One, I would feel a little bit like a charlatan if I was writing about it and unable to sort of see the country with my own eyes. I also 
because I'm a visual writer where I do try and paint those scenes for you as, as accurately as possible, I really wanted to see the landscape, to see the colors, the textures, to eat the fruit, to you know look into the eyes of the people, find some way of being able to communicate with people who might be willing to tell their story as well, which I was super lucky to get that when I went to Vietnam. So, I mean, I have even like missed Vietnamese myths, you know, woven into the book that were shared to me by someone who, you know, told me, you know, stories from their village and things okay. like that. That helps because I was curious, like if you're traveling there, this is, you know, this is years and years later and you mm -hmm. know how, and, and even in 20 years, I used to be a construction where we build a bridge and they're already demolished. Mm -hmm. So Vietnam is not the same as it was all those Absolutely years not. ago. So how, mm -hmm. you know, that was like, how do you reconcile yes. that? Yes. So I was really lucky enough to travel to Vietnam in a small group of people who associated with MIT. And so they were able to also um, interface with people who had lived through the war. One of the professors who was on the trip was actually a, a you know an expert on the Vietnam War. And so we had wonderful guided tours of, you know, the remaining helicopters that are there and even being able to see the foxholes where Viet Cong had been, you know, basically staked to learn about the, you know, the way the war was fought. Um, I was actually even able to meet a Viet Cong uh, soldier, meet with people whose families had survived um, the war who were associated with the Americans and, and learn about, you know, just little details that are so important to writing a book, like when they were given their rice rations and it was the worst, you know, filled with maggots that, you know, they weren't allowed to have a bicycle that they, you know, if their skill was a farmer, they were put someplace, you know, where their skills weren't actually put to use, but where they were, they were to fail. So, you know, these sort of details were really essential for creating the experience of my, you know, family that tries to flee um, Vietnam, Vietnam after the fall and get to America, what, you know, their life was in Vietnam before they got to the United States. Uh, so also I had started to write a lot of, you know, the scenes just because I had to wait to get to Vietnam. And then I got there and I realized I had the, the fruit being in season at the wrong time. And I had to change those things and, you know, little things that, um, I was so glad that I was able to go and to be able to make sure we're accurate. And then on top of that, once I get to a finished manuscript, to be able to find Vietnamese readers to read it to make sure that I, you know, use Vietnamese words correctly, that there were no inaccuracies. Um, also with my Vietnam veteran, you know, making sure everything, you know, every gun that I used, every place he went, how they got there, the language Marines used. I mean, these are things that are not typically in my, you know, learning that way and all those people who go into creating a historically and emotionally authentic manuscript, you know, there's an infinite, infinite amount of people who, who share themselves with me. I think you're one of the most meticulous, passionate authors I've ever <laughs> spoken with. I mean, the smile <laughs> on your face is infectious and listening to you, I'm like, yes, you are, you're living this. I, I'm assuming you're living and breathing this as you're writing these scenes. Yeah, that yeah. is that is. I, awesome. I mean, it, it's true. I feel, especially being a mother, having written before I became a mother, and you know, my I just sent my my last child off to college this year. You're writing even when you're not writing. So yep. if there's any you know mm -hmm. parents out there who are juggling writing a story and also parenting, which is you know we all know is a full time job. I feel that I, I learned to carry the story with me even when I wasn't in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. So I could be, you know, thinking about the scenes and working out the scenes, you know, if I was rubbing my child's back trying to get them to sleep or I was, you know, had 10 minutes to hop in the shower. Okay, what am I going to do when I have the time to be in front of the computer? So that minimizes uh, writer's block. You know, you have it stored up so that it can pour forth when you finally have the time. That's sounds like she right. believes in. Sounds like she believes in writer's block, Jamie. I don't believe it. Either you're inspired, or it doesn't exist. But I, she says something that's very important to me. Yes. No, mm -hmm. hear me out because this is to give me a break. I'm writing Age of the Sigil, even when I'm not writing Age of the Sigil. She's out. Oh, okay. I'm trying to finish the fourth book in a series. I've been so yeah. slow. So when you're like, "Are you on it?" I'm writing it, even though I'm not writing it. Well, I do think there is some validity to be fair in that. I really do because I feel when you're working something out in your head, those knots of a story. It's important to be doing that before you get to the computer. Yep. I absolutely agree because I... Yeah, we have a lot of back and forth. And that's why. Yes, I absolutely agree that because I, when I'm not writing and I'm driving, I'm seeing the scenes in my head. I'm having <laughs> the conversations in my head. 
when I'm on a walk and then people can make fun of me if they want, but they're not, it's me. I don't care when I'm walking. I will literally have the conversation out loud to hear it. Mm -hmm. And when I'm typing, sometimes the conversation, I will say it softly. So my kids don't hear it. Mm -hmm. Just yes. to make it sounds not like it doesn't yeah. sound natural. You need to do that. You need yes. to say it out loud. But, Absolutely. But I, I do that and I write it down. My challenge with Jamie is Jamie throws so many things in the fire so he doesn't have time to write it down. So he's not being but, completely forthright. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I do too many things. But I, in my defense, uh, I don't have, really have a defense. I just teach <laughs> no. a lot, you know, so I have tours. I'm like, I miss writing. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to say that I know The Timekeepers is a fiction novel, but I did read somewhere where this is kind of the account from a true story from a refugee. So yeah. how do you, I love that. How do you mm -hmm. mesh the two together? It kind of reminds me of like the movie, the Titanic, where it was based on something, but it was a fictional story. Maybe not the same way, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? So, um, I don't, I, it's, I'm, I wonder if I should just give the particular thing that ignited my idea to write this particular story of the refugee. But while I was interviewing one of, um, you know, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese refugees who came from Vietnam to America in, you know, 1979. She shared with me that there was someone on her boat who um, had a scar of teeth marks on their wrist. And when I questioned her what had happened, she said that this person had been on a boat, oh, this young boy, he was like eight years old, on the boat um, that had tried to leave Vietnam. And the boat was so overcrowded that as it got to the China Sea, basically, it began to sink. And this and this boy's parents fell into the water. The mother first fell into the water. And then the father went to sort of save her. And the boy, little boy kept on trying to grab his father's wrist to save him. But the father wanted to continue to look for the mother. So he bit the son in order to release his hands so that he could look for the mother and he was never seen again. Oh my God. And that boat was picked up by her boat where this boy was bleeding with this arm, you know, and she learned the story and she was like eight years old, you know? So, you know, here this boy's wrist is being the last thing he has of his father is this imprint of his teeth. Wow. So that image haunted me, you know? So the timekeepers begins with a scene where this little boy has run away from you know, he's sponsored by the Catholic Church to come. The diocese basically sponsored a tremendous amount of Southern Vietnamese who were fleeing Vietnam because many of them were Catholic, but also just in an initiative to sort of to help them try to get to America because of their allyship with the Americans. Many of them, um, the families were sponsored by the Catholic Church. And in on Long Island, and where I live, there was a group of nuns who who sponsored several Vietnamese families. So when these Vietnamese families initially came over, they were put in the mother house before they were able to get on their feet and, you know, live independently on in their own homes. So my novel, The Timekeepers, begins with this Irish woman who is an immigrant herself, who has connections to this church, walking down the street and finding this little boy basically whimpering, who's run away from the mother house. And when she takes him home, she notices this scar on his wrist and she doesn't know what it's about. So you don't yet know the backstory, but it sets off this thing of that, you know, her her empathy is, is ignited. But the true story of how he comes here, we have yet to learn. And at the center of the timekeepers is this watch store called the Golden Hours. Grace Golden is the woman who meets, who meets Bao on the street and sort of takes him under her wing. But this particular watch store has been founded by her father-in-law, who was a World War II veteran who suffers tremendously from, from post-traumatic stress and has a fascination with timepieces. And in order to will himself into the present and into the future, he starts working with clocks. And this becomes a refuge for another veteran, a Vietnam veteran by the name of Jack, who we learn, who also at night, who's disfigured, works on these timepieces. Eventually, this little boy and this veteran, their lives will intersect, you know, in this watch store, and they will both find healing. Um, but as you know, I mentioned, there's a lot of backflashes to Vietnam from both of their lenses that are unique, but also have their own trauma and their, their, you know, own suppressed pain. But eventually, through the watch store, you see how these people's stories come to light. And eventually, um, there is there is a, a healing that all you know, and a friendship, which is really beautiful.
I that's exciting because I feel like again, like I'm gonna recap the what I said earlier about you being a therapist and these books. I think these books are a great way for people to read and see how people overcome trauma in some of the more ways that we don't necessarily think we're there. Like mm-hmm. after reading your The Lost Wife, I had said to my husband, I said this to Jamie, I didn't think of things back then that were going on, but it, it makes it real because you know it was real. And Mm -hmm. so I can imagine a lot of people are more familiar with the Vietnam War that are alive Mm -hmm. because it wasn't as far back and Mm -hmm. they may be able to connect with this, this feeling of, of what was going on, especially with veterans and everything. Yes. And I think, you know, with all historical fiction, even when you're writing about time periods that are even further back, like World War One, or, you know, I have a book that takes place in Meiji period Japan, there's always something... Was that your first book? That was my first novel, yeah. The Mask oh, yeah, of Her yeah. Son. Yeah. There's always these essential bonds between humanity. You know, we all want to you know, protect our children. We all want to be able to have a roof over our head. We all want the freedom to love who we want to love. Um, And so those universal emotions are really important, I think, to mine um, and to show connectivity when you're writing historical fiction, to show Mm -hmm. that in 2024, those feelings still exist just as they did in 1943, you know. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if your child is shivering or hungry, a mother is going to want to keep her child safe and warm and to sacrifice her own food for her child. And that's going to happen in a concentration camp. It's going to happen in Vietnam. It's going to happen in any place in the world when you have mothers and children. Um, And when you have two people who fall in love, that bond between them, that chemistry, it's not something that only happens to Americans. So, you know, how do you show those feelings that a, a re- so that a reader does feel anchored to your character right away? I think it's really important so that they feel an emotional response. And, you know, for historical novelists, we do love history. We want to share with our reader all the wonderful things that we've learned so to to make them enriched with that history and to and to and to be smarter than they were when they they first opened the book but as you mentioned carissa it's not about feeling like a history lesson is shoved down your throat yes it's about creating a narrative where it actually doesn't feel like history it really just feels like yes, you're and you learn something see every history class should just be yeah, a historical exactly. novel like you're walking through their footsteps and your yeah. everyday life of what you're experiencing oh wow through osmosis you're learning about history mm-hmm. it should be fluid that's what we we aim as as historical novelists you know, you you bring up a great point about um, a mother and how she would want to feed her child. And we often talk on the podcast about our books being our children and being these things that we've created. And so with that said, do you have certain characters that you just, I'm sure you love all of your characters, but are there, is there a character, a character or characters that stick with you throughout the entire process that you just remember them? Like they're always in the back of your mind. Like you That's still think question. they're yeah, yeah you still think they're there. So the character of Jack in the Timekeepers, who is a, a wounded veteran who really basically doesn't come out in daylight, who lives above this watch store and then at night works, um, you know, on these timepieces. For me, he is probably one of the most emotional characters that I ever wrote because he is a composite of so many veterans who shared their story with me and not only veterans, but family members of veterans. Like there was someone in my neighborhood who shared a story with me how he had believed his uncle who went off to Vietnam had died, even though they had never gotten a body, they didn't have a death certificate, he was never seen again. And basically five years ago, he learned that his uncle was living above a pizza shop in, you know, two towns over from his, his, his aunt, his wow. mother who had died. And he was so traumatized from the war. He needed to be in close proximity to know where his family was, but he didn't want them to know where he was. So there's an element of Jack in that story. Um, there are just things that happened to Jack during the Vietnam War that were shared to me from Marines, so I created him. And so because he is this composite of so many people who shared intimate s- stories to, with me, uh, to me, he he will always have this sort of fingerprint on my heart, you know, an indelible mark. That's awesome. Do you, okay, with this book coming out, mm-hmm. and it'll be next Tuesday, once this episode mm-hmm. is released, next Tuesday, mm-hmm. October 15th, this book will be available for our readers. 
what is the impact you want this book to have for your readers? What kind of emotions or what do you want them to get from this? Mm. So for me, I want, particularly my generation, you know, I'm 50. So I feel that I really didn't learn about the Vietnam and war. It was too fresh that his, you know, it was written mm -hmm. in history books. Um, maybe we just didn't have enough time at the end of the school year to learn about it, but I knew absolutely nothing about the war before I embarked on writing this novel. And I certainly didn't know anything about the refugees in their, their, you know, exodus to try and get to America for safety. I think in all of my novels, I do want to shed a light on little known history and particularly for readers who, who might not have had exposure to that particular time period. But I also always want to build empathy in my books. I want people to to, to recognize the journey that, that people have to try and find shelter and safety um, and the freedom to love. Um, that that is something that bonds us to each other. And so in a time in the world where there is divisiveness everywhere, I hope this book will be a bridge for people to start to look inward about how important it is to recognize the journey that we all have within us, you know, and, and these emotions that bond us to each other. Yeah. Yeah, I'm blown away. This is a great interview. I got to know, though, what, because you said you've been a writer for over 20 years now. So mm -hmm. what inspired you to become a writer and how did you even get started in this industry? Mm. So I was an art history and Japanese studies, double major in college. <clears throat> My parents, you know, even though my mother was an artist, they really wanted me to find a practical occupation upon graduation. That's where studying Japanese came in. My family lived in Japan for a time when I was in high school. So my father just kept on saying, well, keep up your Japanese because you'll always have a job. I don't know what you're going to do with art history. What I learned in my art history classes is that really it was a teacher who recognized that I had a gift for telling the story behind a painting. You know, so a teacher who pulled me aside one day and was like, I'm reading your paper and you just do a really good job of looking into this painting like a window and to see history, to see the psychological relationship between an artist and muse, to examine, you know, what was going on in history when this painting was created. And it's sort of an obscure compliment, but what I realized is that I love telling stories about creative people against the backdrop of history. And I also, having at one point aspired to be a painter, love the creativity of writing prose, you know, not mm -hmm. wanting to write academic scholarship. So I started to think, well, if I could do anything in the world, what would it be? And I thought to myself, well, really, I would love to write books about artists and examine their experience against certain very dramatic periods of history. And I was very lucky enough to get a grant, something called a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, when I graduated college, which gave me um, about $20,000 to research something that had to do with history and um, in my case, history. So I researched four Japanese artists who left Japan to study with the Impressionist painting painters mm -hmm. and to see what they painted in Europe and then how their paintings changed once they returned to their own native country. And to also sort of examine their, their outsidership, both as a Japanese artist in France, but also having had such a transformative experience how did they reassimilate back into their own native culture? Was, and so I used that research to write my first novel. That's what I was literally going to ask you, did that, did that inspire the, the, yeah. the Mass Harbor Sun? Yeah. So that became, you know, it was like out of heaven, someone gave me money to finance my first research trip. <laughs> I knew I wanted to write a book. I knew what I wanted to write about. And at the end of that year, I had about 100 pages of a novel. And then I did get a job, but I hated the job. And at night I would work to finish the book. And then it was my husband who basically said, okay, you're complaining so much you that you hate your job. I will pay the rent. You pay the utilities for a year. We were engaged at that point. He gave me basically a room of my own, like a little, you know, part of our, our you know, one bedroom apartment. And I finished the book when I was 24. Four wow. and um, got an agent a few months later. The book came out just when I was turning 26, and I've been publishing ever since. That's, That's awesome. awesome. When, when you're not writing, so let's talk about Allison outside of writing. When you're outside of doing these amazing historical fiction books, um, mm -hmm. what are your at, what are your hobbies? What are your activities? Are you still painting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, um, before I had children, used to paint and sculpt. Uh, 
at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan uh, every week. It enabled me to get outside of my head and also was particularly sculpting to have my fingers in the clay. It was very therapeutic and being at the, you know, in contrast to the keyboard every day. So unfortunately, once I had children, when we moved out of the city, I really wasn't able to keep up with those, you know, artistic hobbies. But I did keep always like a little um, watercolor pad that when we would travel, I would always do little watercolors and do things like that. And um, but now I'm an empty nester. So I'm thinking about this year, you know, once my daughter just left for school two weeks ago, so it's still very fresh, but thinking about doing an art class again. Uh, I've always done ballet, which I love. Um, mm -hmm. That also gets me outside of my head. I think get, you know, this, this, you've heard me say getting outside my head a couple times. I think it's really important mentally when you're a writer because your books are always in your head. Mm -hmm. And I think you do need to find ways to release that tension of living two lives constantly, the one that's in you know, your book and then the one that has its own you know, familial obligations and things that we have just in everyday existence. So I'm always seeking out like whether that's a walk or doing some sort of dance. Um, before my daughter left for college, she, she got, bought me a ticket like or a, like a Groupon for tango lessons because I've been Ooh. saying that I wanted to learn how to do the tango. I bought tango shoes when I was in Argentina a couple years ago. And I was like, oh, when you leave school, I'm going to try to take tango <laughs> lessons. And she remembered I said that. So but those are the things I like. And I love my dog. Thank God for my dog, the best writing companion, you know, anyone could have. Yeah, I have cats. Yeah. Yeah. Anything <laughs> with fur. I mean, right? oh, I don't like my husband furry, but like anything that's like, you know, you know, yes. tactile is always nice. Yes. So, okay, you the tango, which brings me to another question. Is there a time period that you're wanting to write about in the future? So I just finished a book that I, I don't know if it'll come out next year or early 2026. Uh, that is about Harry Elkins Widener, who was uh, a 27 year old book collector who perished on the Titanic. And so that was wonderful researching, you know, Edwardian England, you know, he's, he, he's, he's from Philadelphia, but he goes to London to purchase this, you know, one very rare book. Um, and supposedly mentions that he's, you know, never going to take it off his person. Um, when he, when he boards the Titanic. So writing about that time period was wonderful because it was something I'd never done, you know, the Gilded Age. It was, you know, really interesting and, and, and glamorous to write many of the scenes that take place on the Titanic before, mm -hmm. obviously, it, it has a disastrous end. And now I'm working on a, you know, thinking of my, what my next book will be, um, which will probably um, have something to do with World War One, I, I think. Okay. Okay. Before, yeah. <laughs> well, that's super, that's super exciting. I know that I truly, like I said, I truly enjoyed this one. This was kind of in the middle of all your books that you've written, but it was the one that kind of drew me in when I was thinking of one to, to mm -hmm. take on. But for those who want to find you, those mm -hmm. who want to, obviously you're a bestseller. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know who you are, but for those who may not know who you are yet and would like to find you, find your books, all this information, where can they go? Well, thank you for asking, Carissa. You can find me on Instagram, just, you know, at my name, which is A-L-Y-S-O-N-R-I-C-H-M-A-N. On Facebook, um, my author page is Allison Richmond, you know, dash author. And, you know, i on Twitter, just as my name, Allison Richmond, but I'm almost never on it. It's we not, never not use it. We're on there, but we, it's like, yeah. I haven't deleted my account, but it's not something I'm, I've ever been active on. Yeah, me either. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, just before we finish the episode, is there anything you'd like to share with aspiring writers on this journey that you've taken that you, if you could go back in time of your own history, that you would share with them? I think it's so important to keep the faith and to also realize that if you have a story to tell, don't get so hung up on, on, and you know, whether it's going to be published or not to really mm -hmm. just do the work and get the story down on paper, because that experience of, of trying to take a story that has so many different elements and organize it and be able to create a narrative is something that I think is so healthy for us. You know, we all mm -hmm. have a story and the objective doesn't always have to be that it's going to, um, you know, be on the shelves of Barnes and Noble, as wonderful that is, I think it's important to realize that stories in general have always existed to be shared amongst us, mm -hmm. whether they were around the, you know, the fireside at the kitchen table, stories do connect us. And I think they, in a very challenging world, they, they lift us up. 
Oh, yeah. And we have repeatedly said everybody has a story. Just mm-hmm. get it out there. You know, write yeah. it down. Just share it. Even yes. with technology now, we can offer our or not offer. We can I, utilize any platforms to share your story. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And and there's also ways to keep your story if you're not much for writing it down, but you can talk about it. You yes. can easily. Do you ever do that where you just kind of talk to text into a note or something when you're doing things? Yeah, I've tried to do it when like I felt like I was having a day where I couldn't organize my thoughts just by typing it out. And it is helpful. It's helpful. I don't do mm-hmm. it a lot, but um, I have used it. Cool. Awesome. Jamie, do you have any more questions? No, I'm blown like, away like- today. I'm taking this mm-hmm. all in. I'm like, a very, like I said, I, I'm, I'm going, my wife is off today. I'm going straight up to talk about you, send her to your website because she loves history. Yes, and she right. likes what she say the other. She's finishing her hundred and she said I've read one hundred and three books this uh, year so far. Oh actually, my goodness! Actually, it's more because she reads them on another platform and she jumps from this to that to that. And what? But, yeah, and one of her favorite authors like are a lot of the historical authors that we've talked <laughs> about, and so that's why I had told Jamie Diane is going to love this author. <laughs> Well, yeah, because like she like that was she wanted to be a history teacher, uh, but then mm. she went into social work and and she's passionate about that. But she's like, so I know that reading your books, it'll, it'll mm-hmm. she'll probably say the same thing you said. Why don't they use this to teach history in school mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. instead mm-hmm. of you know being bored? C- could you imagine if children are reading? A oh, I would retain book? it so much better. Yeah, they would retain it like oh, they, no, could... they but they are starting to do that. They didn't do it when we were in school, but for example, the lost wife actually. Um, has been taught in several schools and a lot of Catholic nice. schools, which I was a little surprised because some of the scenes are a little bit like romantic. Yes. So. Yes. And my novel, The Thread Collectors, which is a Civil War novel that I wrote with a Black author, that also has been taught in a few schools. So, you know, I do think at the high school level, you're starting to see certain books that they think will resonate with mm-hmm. students um, to learn history that way. Obviously, it's supplementing historical, you know, textbooks, but it's in, it's trying to layer the conversation and get children engaged. So have you ever been asked to, to be an, a guest speaker at a school? I have. I have several times been asked um, <laughs> and also to do Zooms during COVID um, with students. And that's always super rewarding. Mm-hmm. Know? And also letting them know that this type of career exists. You can create your own sort Mm -hmm. of career if you, you know, I fused my love of art and my love of research and under, you know, curiosity to to be a novelist. It wasn't that I, you know, when I was 10 years old, I was going around saying I always wanted to be a writer. But as I got older and I realized what my interests were, this was a way for me to fuse them all together and do something that I (laughs) find meaningful. Well, I think it's even inspiring uh, students to pay more attention to detail. I'm, of course, I'm not a historical fiction writer, but when I write fantasy or whatever, if it's based on Earth, maybe in Poland or here, I do the same thing. I go and I research it. I get on Google mm-hmm. Earth. I mm-hmm. make sure uh, mm-hmm. everything is accurate, and maybe it inspires. You've also been to some of those places as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's like some of the stuff I've written, I haven't been to like Helsinki. And so I would mm-hmm. go there, I would study, I would see what the food was. I, I would mm-hmm. literally look at the buildings mm-hmm. so I could place mm-hmm. my scene in modern times in that area on that street where that building's mm-hmm. at. So, but that's what we need. You know, we mm-hmm. need, uh, you know, with, with the, the blow up of Kindle uh, and everyone does have the right to write a book. And I, you know, everyone has a book inside, but there was no attention to detail when everyone first started publishing. Everyone, I just want to be an mm-hmm. author. So mm-hmm. like talking to you has been so refreshing because the passion and this kind of dedication to making sure everything is accurate. It's what we need in writers. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'm excited. I'm glad I want to follow you on Instagram. So in case you see this crazy, I'll follow you back. I'll follow you back. (laughs) Yeah. If you see this crazy guy on there putting these crazy voice, like video. Yeah. Saturn glass (laughs) voice and stuff. I I appreciate crazy. I I like that. (laughs) All right, so we are so again grateful that you are able to be here on the episode with us and share your insights from writing and becoming a bestseller. And your next book coming out, like again for all those listening, is next Tuesday, October fifteenth, and you can get it everywhere. Correct? Yes. Barnes and Noble, yeah. Amazon, awesome. And I will make sure to link all that stuff in our episode notes so everybody can find Allison and they can find her book. Um, but if you'd like to find us, you can go to alwayswritepodcast.com and we have little icons on there. You can click on any of those. You can watch us on YouTube. You can hear us on Spotify, Apple podcast, Amazon music, just click your favorite. And then you can also go over to our email, 
which is always right podcasts at gmail.com. If you have any questions, if you have any ideas, or if you're an author and you want to come on and you want to share your story, you want to share what you're putting out there, let us know and we'll get you on here. So as always, I'm author Carissa De Delay. Thank you for listening. And this is author Jamie Vendera, and we shall see you in the next podcast. And thank you, Allison, again for coming. Thank you, Jamie and Chris. I appreciate it so much.